Hello, my name's Matt Genge and I'm a scientist at Imperial College. And today I'm going to talk to you about deep time. And this lecture is part of the, the Time and Eternal Life exhibition at Cromwell Place. So I thought I'd talk about how geologists view time. Because I am a, a, a geologist and a planetary scientist. And geologists, along probably with astronomers too, have rather an unusual perspective on what time is. And that's because the objects we study record numerous events in time. And I really today want to investigate what we mean by deep time and how that time can be recorded in a single object. That natural objects can record time is a, a concept that's familiar to most of us. So virtually all of us have heard of fossils, and this is a great photograph of a fossil, and I actually have that fossil with me right now. Um, this is an ammonite, one of the most, most immediately recognisable of fossils. And you can see that it's, it's a shell, it's the shell of a marine organism. And this organism swam around in the oceans around 140 million years ago. And actually the soft part of this organism, which isn't, isn't preserved, looked like a squid, it had tentacles, and these were cephalopods. And they were actually active hunters. They, they hunted other organisms within the oceans. And what this shell records is the form of the hard part of the, uh, of the shell of the organism at the point of death. So it sank down to the ocean's floor, uh, the seabed, and then it was covered up by mud, and that mud then preserved the organism, preserved the shell, when it turned into rock. But more than just the death of the organism, the, the shell also records some events within the life of the organism. So actually on the shell here, you can see ridges, and each one of these ridges relates to the growth of the shell during the organism's life. And the width of the ridges apart, these growth ridges, relates to how much it, grow, it grew during a period of time, probably around a half a month. And at certain stages, the creature also grows an internal barrier, which breaks up the shell into chambers. And actually the cephalopod, lived in the, the, the actual ammonite lived in the the front of those chambers and the other chambers were used as buoyancy aids to help this organism float in the ocean and control its height in the ocean some of these shells also show damage to the shell so they record events that occurred during the life of the organism, such as when a predator came along and tried to grab hold of the shell and dam damaged it. And that damage was, 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 was healed during the lifetime of the organism. So it's a record of events that occurred 140 million years ago. But more than that, these records, what they're actually showing us is extinct organisms. So this creature no longer exists. All the ammonites became extinct about 66 million years ago during a meteorite impact with, with, with the Earth. So actually rocks and, and fossils record the evolution of life, the history of life, the, the multiple events of birth and death and living in between of all these organisms and how the form of organism changed with time just through, through random genetic variations and natural selection. And we see that in particular in the ammonites with their, with their form of their shells changing with time as they evolved. And so when we look at an object like this, 
we're not just looking at the, the a record of the events of the time during which this organism lived, but also its inheritance. All those past organisms that lived and evolved to become this. And we can go an awful long way back in time. Ultimately, all life on Earth stems from just one common ancestor. That very first living organism on, on, on Earth, <coughs> the one that give, gave rise to everything else, would have been a very simple molecule, self-replicating molecule, such as an RNA molecule. And this is a, this is a representation of an RNA molecule. It's very similar to a virus, particularly topical right now. To all of us, everything that's ever lived on Earth, including us, stems from something like this that appeared somewhere around 4 to 4.4 4 .4 billion years ago. So within us, within our DNA, there will be some record of this living thing. When we look at the DNA of, of organisms, there is a lot of DNA that is inherited and shared with other organisms around the planet, including organisms that are now extinct. So we, as objects, as natural objects, also record time. We record events. All those past events, evolutionary stages, that led to us. The rocks record a lot of other events, a lot of other time, other than just living things. So this this is actually one of my one of my favourite specimens. And this, this rock has been cut so that we can see the interior. Um, basically, we used a diamond diamond saw to cut through it. And um, you can see that this is a little black rock with a green fragment in the middle. And the black rock is filled with tiny holes. And earlier on, I, I popped this, this rock underneath my microscope. And so we can take a closer look at the centre of this rock. And you can see that there are two parts. There's a dark area of rock, which is very fine grained. We can just about see some crystals within that rock. So I've just outlined one of the little tiny crystals. But there are also an awful lot of cavities. And these are rounded, smooth cavities that are gas bubbles. This rock was originally magma filled with bubbles of gas, probably steam. And so that was a magma that was erupting from the surface of the earth in a volcano. And then the green area of the rock up above is a fragment of a pre-existing rock that was carried within the magma, that was floating within the magma. So this rock records time. It records events. So firstly, it records the eruption of the magma. And this particular rock is from Sardinia, from a small volcano in Sardinia, and erupted 300,000 years ago. So the bubbles expanded from the magma as it rose up from, from great depth 300,000 years ago. The green rock, this little green rock inside the sample, was a solid piece of rock that was being carried upwards by the magma. And the magma tore that rock up from the deep interior of the Earth, from the Earth's mantle, probably around 60 kilometers below the surface of the ground. So that rock records the history of the Earth's mantle. And actually that mantle has been around for a very long time. So this particular piece of mantle is probably around a billion years old. It sounds really old. 
but some of the components of this rock will be older still. They will have formed when the Earth originally formed 4.5 billion years ago. The Earth's mantle, the internal layering of the Earth, formed as the Earth cooled and separated into layers, with the metal descending to the Earth's core, to form that metallic core, surrounded by the silicate mantle, of which this is the uppermost layer, and then the Earth's crust evolving and changing over time. So a rock like this actually is recording the time over which the Earth has formed, including events in its deep interior. Time isn't just recorded in, in, in special rocks like fossils or rocks from volcanoes. Virtually every rock records a series of events over time. And there are some rocks in the, in the Time and Eternal Life exhibition at Cromwell Place. Um, there's some wonderful sculptures by, by Emily Young um, showing these amazing, amazing faces. And this particular sculpture, the Windhead, um, is described as being made from marble, but to a geologist, a marble is something very specific. Um, this was a limestone that has then been replaced by silica. And some of its original features we can see. So there's some fascinating um, angular shapes here on the neck of the wind head. And that shows that this rock had been fractured and broken up. And actually, we can see some of the silica veins, these white veins running through the rock. And they're associated with those fractures. So it's actually really high pressure water that's smashing through this rock, breaking it to pieces. And you can see the void spaces that would have been occupied by the water. And actually, that tells me something about how this rock formed about its subsequent history. These, this kind of fracturing is very common in mountain chains that form when two continents collide with each other and they trap between them rocks and sediments that deform to make the mountain chain. And in such mountain chains, uh, large faults are very common. And these are faults where one slab of rock slides up over the other to, to build up the mountain chain. And they're very common just in front of the high mountains where there's a series of ridges, each ridges, each ridge sitting over one of these big faults. And actually what makes th these faults possible is water. Because these are big slabs of rock that are very thick and their weight would prevent the, the fault from moving if it wasn't for water. The high pressure water is pumped along that fault and raises the fault up and lubricates it. And that fits with the, with the, with the, the breaking up of the rock by along veins, these high pressure veins. Now the rock is a limestone, so an it also records earlier events when the limestone formed. And limestones typically form on the seabed with a buildup of carbonate minerals, things like the shells of organisms, layer upon layer upon layer. And each one of those layers is recording time. It's recording the environment present at the time. Now, I suspect this comes, the rock comes from the Alps or, or perhaps the Pyrenees. Um, so it's probably Jurassic in age. So, so let's say around 190 million years um, or more. And it's recording a period of time when the Earth's oceans actually covered an awful lot more of the surface. The Atlantic Ocean was opening and organisms like marine reptiles, like ichthyosaurs and pleosaurs, um, abounded in the Earth's oceans. So are very different from today. And the carbonate is being secreted by those organisms that make shells, like our, our friend the ammonite, 
the ammonite takes carbon dioxide from the surrounding water to make its shell. And the surrounding water gets its carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And that's all part of the carbon cycle. So the CO2 in the ocean gets taken up by organisms, built into their shells and then locked away into rocks. And the ocean takes its CO2, largely, from the atmosphere. And the atmosphere gets its CO2 from the weathering of rocks on the surface and from new CO2 released from the Earth's deep interior by volcanoes. So there's a deeper history here in the, in the carbonate, in the, the, the carbon within this rock. And it's a history that takes us deep down into the Earth's interior, where the carbon is locked and stored away, some of it as diamonds. And those diamonds have existed for three and a half billion years. And if we trace that carbon back even further, it was incorporated into the formation of the Earth. And ultimately, before the formation of the Earth was floating around in space as dust. And before that was produced by carbon rich stars more than four and a half billion years ago, prior to the formation of our solar system. Because elements like carbon are made within high mass stars. So there is this enormously long layered history within, within rocks, within objects. The Time and Eternal Life exhibition includes some amazing um, objects from, from ancient civilizations, uh, these wonderful antiquities. And you know, looking at, at their age, one, one can't help be Im impressed and taken aback that they've survived, survived this long. And they have this wonderfully long history of curation all the way back to, to their production from the, the original, the original um, craftspeople. And yet hidden behind those objects are, is more time. There's the people who quarried them. There's the rock and how that rock formed. And then there is how would those elements have been transported and recycled throughout Earth history and how they were originally produced in space. So recorded in these objects is this multi-layered history of time. And the same is true in, in contemporary objects. So this is, this is um, a piece by, by, by John Latham. And I, I included that in here because I actually, one of my colleagues is, is John Latham's son, John Paul Latham. Um, and this, it's a wonderful, a wonderful piece, but this too has a whole history to it. So, you know, there's the event of the art, artist conceiving and making this work. There's the pre-existing event of somebody making the book, of binding the book together, of the author who, who wrote the book and the printer who printed the book. There's the, um, they look like heating elements. Um, the people who made and manufactured those heating elements, the designer who designed them, the iron ore from which the metal was made, the history of that iron ore and how it formed millions of years ago in the past, the recycling of that iron through the earth system over billions of years, and then the production of those iron atoms probably within either a high mass star or a supernova in an exploding star billions of years before the formation of our solar system. And all of that is, is recorded within a single object, within this contemporary piece of artwork. It has this hidden history behind it. So I thought I'd, I'd end this investigation of deep time 
with probably one of the oldest objects that we can find on Earth. And the photograph here shows this, um, this tiny little rock. And it's rather a special rock because this is from outer space. This is a meteorite. And this is a sample of an asteroid. So it's traveled around 300 million kilometers to reach us. And it's around four and a half billion years old. And although it formed four and a half billion years old, lots of events have happened to this rock since. And we can read those events. So again, here, a higher resolution picture taken with my microscope earlier today. And you can see that there is a thin black crust that runs over the surface of the rock. And if you actually look really closely, you can see there's these little dribbles on the surface, these little ridges. This is a fusion crust. This formed as the meteorite entered the atmosphere. And I suspect this meteorite probably landed on Earth in the last hundred years or so. I don't actually know exactly when this one landed. And as it came through the atmosphere, it plummeted towards Earth at more than 11.2 kilometers per second, probably releasing very large amounts of energy, kilotons of energy, as a bright fireball plummeting to Earth. So that's the youngest event recorded within this specimen. But also on the surface, we can, on this broken surface that shows the interior, we can see angular little light fragments of rock that tell us that the meteorite had been broken to pieces and then reassembled at some point in its history. This would have occurred on the asteroids where two asteroids ran into each other. So a recording event, probably an event from a very long time ago, billions of years ago, when there were more asteroids around because asteroids have slowly been destroyed by being by being falling into the sun or being sucked up by the planets. And the asteroid belt has slowly been worn away. And then finally, there are some little rounded objects here. They're quite difficult to see um, in, in this picture. And there's these little rounded objects. And these were actually dust grains that were floating around in the early solar system. So our solar system before it had planets consisted of the sun, the young sun, surrounded by a disk of dust and gas that was spiraling around that sun. And these were the dust grains that were in that protoplanetary disk. And those dust grains stuck together to make larger objects, which stuck together eventually to make planets. So here in this sample is recorded the events, the time at which our planets were forming. And actually this photograph isn't, isn't an artist, artist rendering. This is a, a photograph of HL um, Tau, and it was taken by, by the Atacama Large Millimeter Array by a telescope. Um, and it shows a protoplanetary disk around another star where currently planets are forming. So this rock includes a history that tells us about this monumental process of planets forming and that planets are forming all over our galaxy and throughout the universe. Planets that, that may have living things. And finally, within, within this object are tiny little mineral grains, and actually so tiny I can't, I can't show them to you. With my microscope, we have to use a very specialised microscope, um, which I don't have at home. Um, tiny little mineral grains of unusual minerals like silicon carbide, and, and you might be familiar with silicon carbide as wet and dry paper. But these have such unusual compositions that they cannot possibly have formed in our solar system. They predate 
of our solar system. And these were grains that formed in the atmospheres of giant stars that are now long dead. And we know from, from the dating of some of these grains that they go back to up to about 7 billion years ago. 7 billion years is about half the age of the universe. And to put that into perspective, we know that space and time was created in the Big Bang at the beginning of the universe. So that's half the time that time has existed, which is just incredible from one small object that I can hold in my hand. The concept of, of deep time then is that there is layer upon layer of time of events recorded within within natural samples and we can read those events and observe those events we can detect them looking at, at materials and what i was interested in was what does deep time tell us about the nature of time a physicist will tell you that, that time is a dimension just like space is a dimension. So forwards and backwards, left and right, up and down. And so we, we can draw a graph, of, uh, certainly of space, and this will be a very poorly drawn graph, um, with up and down, left and right, and forwards and backwards. But if we replace up and down, with time, then we can draw a graph of space time, which is a set of set of dimensions with space and time existing together. And any event within time causes some effect. Let's say that event is, is my birth. And the message that I have been born is sent out as a radio signal traveling at the speed of light. And so at any time that signal travels outwards at the speed of light from where I was born and when I was born to form a cone, a light cone. So anybody who lives inside that cone in time and in space could potentially receive the tremendous news that Matt Genge has been born. So there's our little alien observer who's wishing me happy birthday. And of course there is a past light cone and that is all the events that we can detect today. So here we are, that's today. And if I take an object such as a fossil, here's the formation of my fossil in the past. And since we are in the same past light cone, we can detect the formation of this fossil. So some people have said that we perceive time because it moved uh, as a one way street that it's always moving forwards, that we remember the past and not the future because of our perception. And in a way that's true because it depends really on the speed of light and the nature of matter that we can only detect events in our past light cone. And in fact, this diagram is a diagram of deep time. And deep time is everything down here in our past light cone in negative time. What's quite interesting, and an interesting way to end this, this lecture, is, is to consider if there was ever a way that we could detect future events. And to do that, we'd need 
materials, objects, that could travel faster than the speed of light. Because then they could occupy this space outside of the light cone, that, dim that dimensional space outside the light cone. And there is a hypothetical particle called a tachyon that has an imaginary mass or a negative mass. And that type of particle, hy that hypothetical particle, would have to travel faster than the speed of light. And that actually means that for some observers who are also traveling in the same direction as the tachyon, the tachyon can appear to move backwards in time. And relativity tells us that the observations of one observer are just as good as any other observer in defining the laws of physics. So tachyons can move backwards in time. So perhaps somewhere there might be materials, rocks made of negative mass that contain fossils of creatures that haven't been born yet, future fossils. But that is going to be a subject for tomorrow. Thank you.